You are? Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the People's Forum. Is anyone here for the first time? Oh, okay. Let's give them a welcome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome back to everyone who's coming back. Welcome to everyone who might be online, who's online with us for the first time. Um, we are the People's Forum. We're a political education center, a community center, movie theater, bookstore, cafe, art space. Um, we wear a lot of different hats to cater to all the different ways that people engage with building revolution, with upping their po political consciousness. So however you do it, if you're an artist, if you're a dancer, if you just like to sit around and eat, we welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, today, uh, actually today I want to bring a uh, couple of events that we have coming up. Um, next week we start our Revolutionary Summer School, which is our course on Pan-Africanism. Woo! <laughs> It is our biggest course of the year. Hundreds of people from all over the world join, so we encourage you to wow. participate as well. Um, we have, we're going to have three classes a week, movie screenings each week, and plenty more. So we encourage you to join us and learn about the Pan-African struggle and why learning about the struggle on the continent of Africa is so important to understanding and building our struggle here at home. Um, and, you know, in that vein, as a place that is really engaged and invested in the study of history to understand our current conditions and our current context, um, it makes sense that we are having today's book talk. Um, we are interested in uplifting the working class struggles that happen all over the world, as well as understanding the chokehold of U.S. imperialism and having a clear understanding of our enemy and why it continues to oppress us. And so in that vein, um, we are having today's book talk on uh, China's revolution and the quest for a socialist future. We're witnessing a buildup of a new Cold War. Um, the U.S. is ramping up its project of intimidation and fear-mongering against China, and so we have to ask the question, why? Why is there such an intense project to make China an enemy, and how do we uncover the truth? Um, and it's becoming more urgent in that vein to take a level-headed and contextualized understanding of China and its history and see why China has become such a target of U.S. media and foreign policy. And so this book takes a couple, you know, a couple hundred years of history and puts into a couple, <laughs> not even a couple hundred pages, into a hundred pages um, and teaches us about the history. It condenses it. We see the struggles of people um, throughout his Chinese history um, against first um, literal emperors against U.S. and Western imperialist conquest, and then seeing how that enemy has evolved today. Um, and so it becomes crucial to understand history so we can understand and have a critical and clear outlook on how we understand China and U.S.'s engagement with China. Um, and so in that vein, we're going to be having two awesome guests with us today. <laughs> um, Woohoo! First, we have the author of today's book, Ken Hammond. Um, Ken Hammond is a professor of East Asian and Global History at New Mexico State University. He was also the founding director of the Confucius Institute at the university, and he is an organizer with the peace organization Pivot to Peace. We also have with us Sheila Shao. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. <laughs> Um, she is a researcher, data scientist, and community organizer, and she is a second-generation Chinese-American who was raised in San Francisco, studied at UC Irvine and University of Hong Kong, and she is a tireless advocate for communities of color and the co-founder of Pivot to Peace. Um, Pivot to Peace is also an organization of concerned Americans who have come together to oppose the United States' war drive and towards aggression on China, and she was one of the coordinators of the People's Summit last summer. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's give them a warm welcome because both of them are dear comrades of the space. Um, and 1804 Books, our very own bookstore and press, is the publisher of the book. So we're extra excited, extra excited <laughs> <laughs> um, for today's book talk. Um, and I have one more announcement to make, which is a very dear one to me. Um, TPF is celebrating its fifth anniversary this September. Woo! Woo! Very exciting, very exciting. Um, and in that vein, we are celebrating how far we've come in five years, but also how far we have left to go. So if you enjoy today's talk, if you, even if you don't enjoy, if you have questions, <laughs> you're curious, um, we encourage you to support our work financially by donating um, on our website. Um, it's a really important thing to do, just to literally keep this space open, to keep this work going. It's really crucial. Um, and so please go to fiveyears.peoplesforum.org. Um, and I think that's enough from me. Sheila and Ken are going to give us a couple of presentations. I'll have a few questions, but I encourage you all to come with your questions as well afterwards. Sound good? All right. Awesome. All right. Well, 
I guess I'll just get started. Thank you all so much, and thank you, TPF, for opening up the space. And I just wanted to shout out again, please donate to TPF. Keep the space open. We want to keep these spaces open. Um, and we know rent is high, very high. So. Um, so yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm just so thrilled to be here, to be with you, to be with Dr. Ken Hammond and our friends here at the People's Forum for, this, for the launch of this very, very important new book, China's Revolution and the Quest for a Socialist Future. Who has picked one up already? Awesome. <laughs> I hope everyone raises this, their hands at the end of this talk. Um, so Dr. Ken Hammond is a socialist. He is a lifelong organizer for social change. And actually a little known fact about Ken is that 53 years ago, he was a student at Kent State. He was involved in the protests that culminated with the massacre, the brutal massacre of students who were protesting the Vietnam War. And like so much that happens, the victims of government repression, of government crimes, were made out to be the perpetrators, and that's what happened to Ken and his comrades. Dr. Ken Hammond and other students were arrested and faced years in prison for their role in the anti-war movement. They were known as the Kent State 25, and it was another injustice, and eventually they were all set free. Because they were innocent, obviously. Um, <laughs> Ken Hammond is an expert on China. This book only scratches the surface of his vast knowledge, and he truly knows so much about, about China. And I hope everyone does buy this book, read the book, study the book, and study it with friends and family. Ken is a partisan. He is also a writer and historian with great objective faculty. And I actually want to talk, uh, focus my talk today on another group of partisan writers. They have a particular point of view. Or maybe a better way to put it is that they are employed by corporate-owned media organizations and think tanks to further an, an, uh, an agenda, a narrative. And these people are responsible for generating an anti-China hysteria here in the United States that attempts to portray everything that China does as something sinister. And they try to portray movements for peace and so social justice including socialist movements, as something sinister, diabolical, conspiratorial, something that constitutes a great menace. These partisan writers are fulfilling the same political task and function as those who helped engineer and promote the witch hunt of the 40s and 50s in the United States against anyone who was considered to be a communist, anyone who stood up for social justice, anyone who was considered a socialist, an advocate for peace, anyone who advocated for peace with the USSR during the Cold War, um, especially during the height of the Cold War. The point of the witch hunt, as we know, the witch hunt in the 40s and 50s is virtually being reproduced today. Um, whether we know it or not, it, it totally is. I think anyone of us who's been following the media can see it. It was then and is today the promotion of mass paranoia within the American population, repeatedly telling the public that they should be fearful of an imagined threat, that subversive threats could be lurking everywhere. Witch hunts usually have an undisclosed objective, but they also take a life of their own. And in the 40s and in the 50s, members of the media built their own careers by destroying the lives of so many innocent people. Ken's book, is an antidote to this hysterical anti-China ravings that are dominating corporate-owned media and think tanks. As we know, in the past couple years, um, anti-Asian hate crimes has been on the rise. Hatred and fear of China is on the rise. And if you look back to how China was treated in the United States media just 20 years ago, compared to today, it is impossible not to notice the tone and tenor um, that has changed so dramatically. All articles about China are negative. The Chinese leaders are caricatured as evil incarnate. And I don't think that I need to remind you of this anti-China rhetoric and storyline, which coincides with the deep-rooted racism against Chinese people that has been present in this country for over 150 years. And it's easy to blame the individual perpetrators of anti-Chinese violence for their terrible deeds, but we know that this is not the this is not what caused anti-China racism, right? The wave of anti-Asian violence in America has to be understood not as an aggregate of individual acts of racism. It is the corporate-owned media, 
It is the U.S. agenda that has created the atmosphere of hatred and hysteria against all things Chinese that has created the environment for racist hate crimes to multiply so exponentially. And then after the last witch hunt ended, the American people learned that this was a terrible disgrace in our, in our history, right? It was a terrible mark of shame because so many people's lives, as I said earlier, innocent lives were ruined, were destroyed. Movies like The Front popularized this terrible repression that was visited upon artists, film directors, movie actors, musicians, academic figures, and others who were associated in the 40s and 50s with socialism, with communism, or for any struggle for peace and against racism. And now that there is a new witch hunt against China, the US corporate owned media is back to playing the same disgraceful role now in the 2020s as it did in the 40s, in the 50s, and even the 60s. Americans were told that Joe McCarthy was a disgraceful witch hunter. That's what we learned even in our history books. But this was later, decades later, after his criminal witch hunt destroyed the lives of so many. But McCarthy and McCarthyism was generated, most importantly, by mainstream corporate media. It was through the New York Times, it was through the Washington Post and other respectable media outlets that promoted this witch hunt. Without the role of reporters and without the role of media, McCarthyism would not have taken shape and would not have reached the terrible dimension that it did. And I want to give you a few examples of these headlines. Here's a headline from the New York Times in February 12th of 1950, quote, McCarthy insists Truman ousts Reds, 57 communists are still on the job at State Department despite loyalty list, end quote. And here's another one from July 15th of 1956, quote, Red said to lure youthful actors, inquiry is told that many communists remain in the entertainment business, end quote. I just want people, when they hear that the headlines, to remember that this was seven years after the criminal conviction of the Hollywood 10, the destruction of some of the most celebrated Hollywood creators, not because of what they had done, but because of who they were, what they believed in, what they had thought, because of the work that they did. The New York Times and the House of Un-American Activities Committee made, it, made them out to be sinister and diabolical criminals. And I want to mention a third headline, which was not from the 50s, and it wasn't from 1956 or 1950. It wasn't even during the height of the anti-communist witch hunt in America. This was actually from the 60s. So this headline was from May 9th, 1961. And 1961, again, is long after Joe McCarthy had left the scene. And again, this is a New York Times headline. It says, quote, and in all caps, red threat is cited. Communists said to renew Hollywood efforts, end quote. Friends, we are at a crossroads. In 2011, President Obama announced the pivot to Asia, and it was really hard at the time to really understand what he meant by that. But by 2018, during the Trump administration, it became clear, right? The Pentagon announced that it was adopting this new military strategy, that the war on terror was no longer the priority, which you know, let me remind you, this government spent billions of dollars funneling money into this war on terror, which was a, which was a failed project. And now they want to renew and reshift their military strategy towards major power conflict, which of course means preparation for conflict with China, which is a powerful country. At the same time, all of the US corporate owned media adopted as if it was almost an echo chamber for US government policy, coverage that was only negative and hostile towards China. The FBI and Department of Justice launched investigations against academics and universities throughout the country. Prominent scientists have been put on trial. They were bankrupted. They were fired from their positions. Chinese American political activists have also been targeted. Being Chinese, talking to Chinese media, going to a conference in China, participating in protests in support of the One China policy, all of these things made people a target. And by the way, the one, Chi the one China policy is official U.S. policy. So even speaking out to hold the government, the U.S. government accountable of its own policy makes you a criminal. And it's not just the government, it's the corporate-owned media. 
It's the reporters, people who like to go to cocktail parties and present themselves as serious people, as serious journalists who have joined together in this despicable witch hunt of ruining pennies or Asian people in America feel insecure, to feel scared, to feel vulnerable as hate crimes rock the country. So I want to thank Professor Hammond and I want to thank the People's Forum and all of you who are here today who are standing up to this new witch hunt. We are standing together because we advocate for peace and cooperation with China rather than war and confrontation. That alone has made our efforts uh, to be subjected to target by this witch hunt. Telling the truth and making American people informed about China as it really is. To understand the immense historic contributions to alleviating poverty, to dealing with climate change, to understanding how China has emerged from a century of humiliation by foreign powers in its quest to become a modern socialist country. Telling the truth is easy, but sometimes in historical eras, and even today, telling the truth is actually an act of courage. China is being demonized by the Western media, and the people who advocate for peace or even telling the truth about China are being demonized as well. So I do hope that folks here take the book seriously. I hope that you learn from it as I have learned from it. I want to encourage everyone, you know, don't just learn about China simply to know about China or simply because it's interesting because, well, it is interesting, but becoming knowledgeable about China so that you can play a role here in the United States in refuting anti-China rhetoric to refute the witch hunters who are doing so much damage to the society and to the individuals and individuals' families who dare to say the truth. Thank you again, and on behalf of Pivot to Peace, I want to thank you for including us in this discussion. The military-industrial complex benefits from a, a pivot to war, but we, the people, and the people of the United States and the people of China, must advocate that history requires a pivot to peace and a rejection to endless war. Thank you. So I'll pass it over to Ken. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> um, well, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk about this new book and talk about the situation in which we find ourselves these days. I want to start, though, by, of course, observing that intellectual production, just like other kinds of production, is social production. This isn't something that, that just pops out of one's head. And so I want to just take a moment and say thank you. Of course, I'm very grateful. I want to say thank you to the People's Forum for having this event tonight, having us here. I want to say thank you to 1804 Books for the work that's been done to bring this project out into print so that it's something that people can have access to. But putting this book together, um, of course, uh, I you know, give a super shout out to Brian Becker and to Eugene Purrier, who also wrote parts of this book. All right. Um, and in the process, this took a couple of years to put together, and uh, you know there were a lot of people that were part of the discussions at the beginning of this project and who contributed their ideas, their reflections, their comments along the way, Sheila being one of those. Um, uh, comrades that may be watching uh, uh, online tonight, like uh, Satya, who's now in Atlanta, Samina and uh, Chakib out in the West Coast, uh, and others with whom there were conversations and, and feedback and things like that. So I want to uh, uh, acknowledge that. And uh, of course, uh, my, the, my comrades, my, my colleagues, my fellow organizers with Pivot to Peace, there's a lot of them. I'm not going to try and name everybody. Um, and uh, and uh, in the process of, of uh, bringing this uh, through, also uh, uh, Keith Pavlik and, and Ryan who, Hamby, who's around, oh, he's in the booth, um, <laughs> want to acknowledge them. Uh, because uh, you know it's it's been a long and winding road, so we don't we don't get here as a result of of uh, as Chairman Mao says, uh, ideas falling out of the sky. Um, <laughs> you know, this is something that has been a collective endeavor, and I certainly hope will remain so going forward. Um, having said that, uh, let me talk a little bit about about the book. And uh, I know we're going to have some questions, and I'm hopefully looking forward to questions from you all. Um, so really the basic thing I want to say is, is basically explaining the title, you know, because the title of the book is China's Revolution and the Quest for a Socialist Future. 
And, uh, you know, big chunk of the book, of course, is, is historical, is talking about um, China's transformation from what had been a powerful, prosperous society for many, many centuries, were probably the leading economy in the world for a long time, its transformation in the 19th century to a, a, a sort of hollowed out uh, economy and, a, and a, a dominated society, what the Chinese continue to refer to quite properly as the century of humiliation, as Western imperialism, driven by the power of the Industrial Revolution, which not only transformed their productive economies and finally made Western goods competitive in global markets, but it also armed them with modern military technologies that allowed them to project power in new ways and to craft over the you know, first decades and the middle of uh, the 19th century, the system of global imperialism and colonialism, which dominated much of the world for almost a century and a half. Uh, we also, in the book, of course, follow the story of China's fight back, of how uh, the revolution developed, uh, the emergence of the Communist Party, uh, the inspiration of the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, the adaptation of uh, Marxism and Leninism uh, from the sort of ideals and, and uh, experiences of, of the West to be integrated with and suitable to the, the concrete environment, the material realities of China and the revolutionary mission there. And then we talk about the, the struggle beginning in 1949. Winning power is one thing, and then what you do with it is very much another. And so this is where the word quest comes in, because we don't want to simply say revolution succeeded and, you know, it's like flipping a light switch. Here we now we have socialism, uh, you know, because it's not like that. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, revolutionary thinkers, Marxist thinkers, uh, have, have always acknowledged this, talked about this as a long historical process. It's a process of development. It's a process of change. You don't change the economy overnight. You don't change people's consciousness overnight. This is something that has to happen over, over a long period of time. And it doesn't mean that because the Red Army comes into Beijing and because the People's Republic is declared and because now the Communist Party assumes the leading role uh, in, in the governance of China, it doesn't mean that, that uh, the challenges are, are overcome or eliminated. And in fact, new challenges will emerge along the way. And so we try to trace some of that out um, as well through the book. Um, it's also the case that, that uh, you know, we're not trying to say that, that China has achieved all of its objectives, that China has become a socialist utopia, uh, a happy worker's paradise, or anything like that. Uh, we recognize that there are contradictions that have emerged in the course of the work to, to build a socialist future, uh, that those contradictions can be quite serious, that there continue to be contending class forces in China today. Um, what gives this book and, and the, the political associations that I work with a, a particular perspective is that uh, we continue to see the socialist project in China as one which is a work in progress, one which is facing challenges, but which has achieved tremendous accomplishments and which we need to support and encourage while recognizing the challenges that it faces and while recognizing that it's not going to be a simple, straightforward, uh, you know, infallible process, but something that's going to have its twists and turns as it has all along and will continue to in the future. So our mission is to support that, to encourage that, to, to have solidarity with the efforts, the, the quest of China for a socialist future. Because that quest, that struggle is also important for us. It's important for the future of our planet. It's important for the development of working people all over the world. It's important for us as, uh, as we used to say back in the 60s, as uh, you know, fighting in the belly of the beast, to, uh, to arm ourselves with knowledge as we go forward, struggling against American imperialism, struggling, struggling against the capitalist system here at home in our own effort to progress along the path towards a socialist future. And just as China's path has been you know, back and forth, up and down, victories, challenges, defeats sometimes, uh, ours has been too certainly will be in the future. But every step that we can take in, as the, again, as the Chinese say, seeking truth from facts, uh, we often find that the path forward, to invoke the Chinese again, 
uh, is a matter of uh, crossing the river by feeling the rocks. We don't exactly know where we're going. Uh, we know where we want to get to, and we make our progress dialectically by one step at a time. So my hope uh, in, in undertaking this process uh, has been to, to make a contribution to knowledge, to make a contribution to understanding, make a, a contribution to fighting against the demonization and the, the hostility that has become so characteristic of American media, American political elites, probably the, the single most bipartisan uh, 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 consciousness in, in Congress uh, these days is hatred for China. Uh, and it's a sad thing to be the, uh, the one uh, uh, sentiment that, that crosses the aisle in, in Washington, uh, other, of course, than the, the preservation of the power of the ruling class. Um, but we find ourselves, obviously, in a, in a particular moment where arming ourselves with knowledge, taking that out uh, uh, into, into the work, again, as Sheila was saying, to work of, of organizing, the work of educating, and the work of pushing back, uh, and trying to advance the struggle uh, for ourselves, for the American working class, uh, and for working people around the world, and in solidarity with the people of China who continue along their path, uh, I think with great hope for the future, and uh, certainly with all of our uh, best wishes in that struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila and Ken. Um, I have some, you know, pretty straightforward questions, so I encourage you all to come with, up with the more elaborate ones. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just want to start kind of digging back into what you were talking about, the title, this quest. Again, this book isn't called China and We've Already Achieved Victory, It's a Socialist Society, which yeah. would not make for a very good title. But um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the history that you elaborate on throughout the book. Um, you show us this relentless threat of struggle, like even when the, the enemy is emperors, um, you see, well, you actually talk about the ebbs and flows of mass struggle throughout. So Sometimes it's not as active. When it does become more active, it's extremely, um, extremely impactful. And you can see how it kind of builds up to the moment um, in 1949. Um, but I guess I want to ask, there's always things to learn about from people who have been fighting for centuries. You know? um, are there lessons for us to extract from the struggle um, that they've waged um, in our own context as they battle off emperors and US imperialism, and then as we do so in our own very different context? Um, yeah, I guess I want to start there. OK, OK. <laughs> well, yes, obviously, I think that uh, uh, you know, for us, uh, in, in, in our efforts here to, to build a, a more just and equitable society, um, it's important for us to study revolutionary experience everywhere. And, and China, as one of the great revolutions of the 20th century and an ongoing project today, uh, certainly is worthy of, of our attention in that regard. I think that, that there are a number of lessons we might draw. One, um, and, and several of these show up in various formulations that, uh, that Chairman Mao made famous, um, one would be to unite all those who can be united, uh, to, to build broad coalitions. This is the sort of work that, that organizations like Pivot to Peace do, or the Answer Coalition, groups like that, certainly the kind of work that goes on here uh, in the People's Forum, uh, to, to try to Keep your eye on the prize. You know, work with those who share the, the, the goals and the objectives. We don't have to agree on every point of ideological refinement, but we need to find common ground uh, with people and, and to, try to try to work together and, and exchange ideas and, and develop our own ideas uh, in a kind of, kind of open-minded way. And I think that that's a very important lesson that we draw from China. I think that... Um, Part of that uh, uh, is, is the importance that, that, again, Chairman Mao has laid out very clearly of, of the dialectic of theory and practice, that, that we have our ideas, we formulate our ideas, we put those into practice. Some things work, some things don't. We refine our thinking, and, uh, and we put it into practice again. It's an ongoing, open-ended process, and I think that that's something that the Chinese have been very good at. Uh, they haven't been wed to one strict rigid interpretation of things, but have adapted over the years, adapted during the revolutionary struggle, adapted uh, uh, throughout the history of the, of the People's Republic, and, and certainly continue to do so today. Uh, so that's, a, that's another. Um, and, and sort of in tandem with that, to be patient. 
Uh, one thing that, that I find myself talking about in many contexts, I, when I, in my classes with my, with my students, when I, I sometimes work in China uh, with, with uh, travel uh, projects, travel programs, and, and, and try to educate people there about that, is that, uh, is that the Chinese, Chinese culture, if you will, has a much different historical timeline, I suppose you might say, uh, uh, than, than certainly America, uh, than many things in the West. America, America has in many ways kind of a, kind of a willful uh, amnesia approach to history of, uh, of, of, of you know, not really engaging very seriously with it. I mean, we see a lot of this right now in our domestic politics with, with struggles over wokeness and, and, and teaching about the history of slavery and things like this. These should be integral to our understanding, and yet these are contentious issues whether teachers can even talk about them in their classrooms. That's kind of silly. Um, but in China, there's a much longer historical time frame, uh, thinking not in terms as, as, I think much of this is driven by our capitalist culture of looking at the next quarterly statement or the next annual report or things like this, much shorter time frames, the electoral cycle. You know, politicians can't think more than two years in the future. Uh, uh, you know, whereas that's a, there's a very different uh, sensibility of that. And this is part of why we talk about the quest, this idea that it's not something that's going to happen quickly. We're not going to achieve socialism overnight. It's going to take decades, possibly centuries. And, and Mao wrote about this. Marx, of course, wrote about this. Lenin wrote about this. Uh, we all know this. Um, and yet there seems to be this expectation, expectation uh, especially among some comrades on the left, that, uh, that if China isn't 100% perfectly socialist now, then it just must have sold out to capitalism and has to be condemned. And I, you know, I mean, I think that that's a very Western short-sighted perspective, uh, not taking into account the, the challenges along the way. One of the things that we try to explore in the book is the, uh, you know, the, the, the way in which this adaptability has meant that sometimes China's had to be a little more accommodating to the global capitalist system and to American imperialism in order to extract from that system benefits for the development of, of its economy. Uh, you know, having to be a little more accommodating. That period, thank goodness, is over, uh, uh, which is why America is so infuriated. But, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's part of having a longer-term perspective. Um, so, so I think that's another important thing. But... I wanted to draw one lesson from the Chinese experience, the revolutionary experience and, and the struggles since liberation. Uh, it would again be one of, one of Mao's uh, most famous and most simple uh, uh, statements, which is, dare to struggle, dare to win. Thank you for that, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess in relation to what you're saying, um, there seems to be a united front also against China. <laughs> um, we, there are so many books out there um, about China, and most of them, of course, take a hostile stance. Um, and we also see that project kind of connected to what you were talking about, Sheila, in terms of the New York Times headlines, how reporters, how media all joins together to create, to make a demon out of China. Um, we see the weather balloon, spy base, <laughs> um, Biden calling Xi a dictator right after um, uh, Lincoln goes to these relations. And that's all just this year, you know? <laughs> and there's been a decade since um, the victory of the revolution. And so this book actually is a very careful one in terms of its approach. Um, it does, as you were saying, it resists idealizing China, but it doesn't demonize it in the way that we see in our media every single day. Um, so in that vein, I wanted to ask, why did you write this book now, in this current con conjuncture? Um, and I guess maybe for you and Sheila, what is next in the political landscape around China? What challenges will it face? OK. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the reason that we put the book together now um, was that uh, kind of on, on, on two tracks, or you know, from, from two fronts. Um, one, of course, is simply that this intensification of American hostility towards China has been an ongoing development, uh, you know, starting with uh, Obama's uh, pivot to Asia and, and uh, Secretary of State Clinton's call for a new American Pacific century back in 2011, uh, escalating through uh, uh, the, the, the silliness of the Trump years. 
Uh, and now uh, being taken to, to uh, remarkably uh, even higher levels of, of idiocy um, under, under, you know, <laughs> the old cold warriors in, in the Biden administration. Um, it's, a, it's a changing environment, and, and, and there's a need to respond to that. Uh, but also, uh, it's, it's, you know, the, uh, there's a, uh, the PSL published an, an earlier book about China back in, in 2006, 2007. Um, and, and there's been changes in thinking about China. There's been changes in perceptions about China and understanding about China, um, in part because uh, this, this phase of, of accommodation, this phase of greater sort of uh, integration with the global capitalist system has passed uh, and, and China has become more self-confident. It has achieved a great progress, great development. The, the material prosperity of the society has been enhanced. People's life expectancy has grown. Uh, infant mortality is down. Educational opportunity, housing, all these kinds of things, healthcare, all of these things have, have really been bolstered. And China can now be more self-confident, more self-reliant, and certainly is, is pursuing its goals, its objective, its hopes and ambitions uh, a lot more um, autonomously, independently, without, without having to subordinate itself to these, to these alien forces. And that has made, especially uh, uh, since the emergence of Xi Jinping back in 2012, uh, that has made the situation a little clearer. And it's given us, I think, a very different understanding. So it's a, it's a kind of conjuncture of internal and external uh, uh, factors or, or, or trajectories that, that created an opportunity. It seemed like an opportune moment to reassess and to rethink and to, to, to put out a new, uh, a new uh, statement, if you will. Um, as far as the challenges, yeah, that's a, that's a big, uh, you know, that's a big set of issues, and and I think that that there are there are political challenges in China because there are bourgeois forces in China. There's private capital. There are uh, certainly elements which would uh, like to to move the country in a different direction. Uh, there are economic forces uh, uh, in terms of, in terms both of private capital, but also of you know this mechanism of using the markets to develop the economy. Markets have an inherent impetus towards inequality, towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, maldistribution of resources. They are very effective in some ways, but they, they generate contradictions and, and problems in other ways. And that's an ongoing thing because the process of development isn't over. That's an ongoing, it's a work in progress. It's an ongoing task. And so, you know, managing that, keeping that under control, keeping the, the you know, being able to, to get from the market the benefits that they want while containing to the best degree possible the, the adverse effects. This is a ser very serious ongoing challenge. And of course the environment, you know, China is, is uh, making great strides. This is an area in which, you know, China has become a leader in, in alternative energy and electric vehicles and, and all kinds of, of technologies and, and all this, but they remain very heavily dependent upon coal uh, uh, you know they're they're uh, they're trying to grow the economy. They're consuming resources. These are these are challenges that they're trying to uh, trying to cope with because they have to face they face a very delicate uh, 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 trajectory of of balancing the need for economic growth and development with trying to produce a society that is sustainable, responsible, more just, more equitable, and those are. Balancing those interests can be can be a, a delicate operation, uh, and 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 again, uh, you know, we don't believe that that uh, the victory of socialism is finally 100% guaranteed. We recognize that this is an open, uh, ongoing struggle. Uh, we're we're hopefully, you know, we're hopeful and and to a reasonable extent, uh, uh, cautiously optimistic about the endeavor, but we have to be realistic that there are still. Um, obstacles to be overcome, and uh, certainly the potential for, uh, for for errors, miscalculations along the way. So there are, there are significant challenges in the present conjuncture, and one of the points of the book is is to try to make that clear that 
it's not some kind of starry-eyed, uh, uh, rose-colored glasses perspective, but that we have to, it's only responsible to recognize the challenges and to try to, uh, to, to, to make people sensitive to that as well. Want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I just wanted to say the book is just such a beautifully written, concise, like, I don't know how you fit that many years of history in this tiny book, but it is, Ken is an amazing storyteller and just really lays out the history in a very clear way. No jargon. It's very understandable. So just, again, shouting it out. People should read it. Um, it's an incredible contribution to our work here. Anyone who's done any work around anti-war efforts, um, understanding why the U.S. is escalating war tensions, you know, albeit with China, with Russia, you know, the war on terror, right? It's important that we know this history um, to arm ourselves with this information so that we can explain what is actually being said about China, right? Um, I think that the the brilliant, th I mean, there's, this book is brilliant in general, but um, so much of the history of China that has been distorted is is addressed head on in this book. You know, the, the things we've been told about the Great Leap Forward, the things we've been told about the Cultural Revolution, the things that we've been told about the Tiananmen Square, all of these fabricated numbers of how many millions and billions of people died um, <laughs> that are just false. Ken explains the historical context in which all of these events happened so that we have a deep appreciation for the struggle that China has taken on this quest for socialism as we, as we keep talking about. And so as an organizer with Pivot to Peace, this book is a valuable resource for us to really just have a, a snapshot of this history in fighting against the demonization of China. Um, this book helps us appreciate, again, the struggle that China has gone through. You know, in my parents' lifetime, they were born in China. Um, they grew up in China. And in their lifetime, they didn't have plumbing. They didn't have running water. And now they've seen a country that has achieved, has lifted 850 million people out of abject poverty, right, of absolute poverty. What is, like, people are proud of that. Whether or not you believe in communism or not, if you're from China, you're going to be proud of that. Um, and I'm certainly proud of it. So I think just having an appreciation of what has been achieved under the socialist project, under the threat of U.S. imperialism, is worth knowing about, is worth understanding. Um, and the truth is, as we know, as, you know, people who have been in, in the movement, in the anti-war movement, is that any nation that dares to fight for any type of sovereignty, for any independence, whether it's socialist or not, um, it's going to have to do so under the threat of U.S. imperialism, you know, to, you know, try to resist being subordinate to U.S. interests. Um, so that's why this book is such a, a contribution. I'm excited to use it as a tool to further the work of Pivot to Peace um, and really just grounding ourselves in the history and the knowledge of China so that we're not defensive when people attack China. It's <laughs> that we actually know the history to explain it to people. Let me, the book is a short book and, and, and I recognize that, but I'm gonna explain why that is, which is that <laughs> I, I got involved with all of this back when I was in college, you know, and I, I, got, I joined SDS in 1968 and all this kind of stuff. And, 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 and what that meant was that I learned to write leaflets, oh, you know. Yep. We don't do that much anymore, right? But back we in know. those days, you know, you had to fit your argument onto an 8.5 by 11 sheet. So we're trying we'll to explain imperialism <laughs> and the war in Vietnam and racism and poverty and theory and all this stuff. And you got to get it on there with a graphic, right? <laughs> so I learned to write very concisely down in the trenches. And this is a lingering effect of that. It's a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Um, kind of <laughs> continuing in that vein, actually. <laughs> um, I guess I wanted to ask um, about the approach of the book. As Sheila said, it's like a really key resource. It's, you know, as a young person reading it, I found so many answers in the text, and I was a quick read. You know, my attention span due to TikTok is like five seconds these days. <laughs> so I was very thrilled to be able to read a book and find a lot of answers to the things that trouble me, that I see in the news, all in, in a very short volume. Um, and it's very, like I said, efficient and practical. So. 
it's a huge undertaking to condense all these histories. I also heard a rumor you have like a 36 part YouTube series just on like <laughs> thousands of history of chi years of history of China. So how do you how do you how do you compile this history? How do you tell a story of China that gives its reader a very level-headed understanding, a very contextualized understanding of the history of China. Who are you writing, who are you thinking of writing of, when, writing to when you were um, writing this book? Yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a number of ways to, that, that, that one thinks about that. Um, of course, I'm a, you know, I'm a teacher, and so <laughs> it's another thing I like about short books is my students might actually read them. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was a student once. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, you know, I think about uh, trying to make, trying to write a book that, uh, that the kids that show up in, in, in my Chinese history classes or, or my global history classes might, might read. It's, you know, want to engage them, want to make it accessible. I don't want to load it up with a lot of technicality and, and, and you know, rhetoric and stuff like that. Um, and, and really, I mean, uh, ultimately, the, the objective in writing a book like that is, is that, that ordinary people uh, across the country, not that, you know, I don't have aspirations of being on the Times bestseller list, but, um, <laughs> but I do hope that, that, you know, ordinary people could, should they encounter the book, uh, read it, make sense of it, learn something, something from it. Uh, but uh, also, of course, one, ha one bears in mind that, that uh, probably, in reality, the, the, the principal audience for this book will be uh, people who are working uh, uh, for peace, uh, against war, against imperialism, uh, for social change, hopefully building of socialism. Um, and so I wanted it to be a tool. I wanted it to be something that, that people could utilize uh, because when we talk to people, I mean, certainly this is my experience, you find yourself in a social situation, you know, you, somebody says, oh, yeah, you know, Ken, uh, Ken teaches about China. And they're, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> gosh, you know, uh, how about them Uyghurs, you know, uh, or something like Jeez. that, you know. Um, and, and it's like, where do you begin, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, now at least hopefully people can have some place to begin. Uh, and and so for for our for our organizers, all of us uh, in our in our mass work, as it were, um, you know, it's I wanted it to be a be uh, you know something else in the in the toolbox. Um, but we also talked uh, when when we were getting this this project underway. Um, we also talked about about hopefully that it might get some traction uh, in in around the world in other countries, you know, because we want people in China, in other parts of the world, to know that not everybody in America is jumping on imperialism's bandwagon. We want them to know that there are other perspectives, that there are people who have this struggle in their, in their hearts and their minds. And, and, you know, the book hasn't been out that long, but uh, there are some encouraging signs. I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> next week I'm going to Paris to a, a workshop at the, the Institute for Advanced Study in the Social Sciences. Um, where I'll be presenting the book and, and you know, scholars and, and, and activists from other parts of Europe will be around. So hopefully we'll get a little traction there. I've also been, uh, I'm, get, I'm getting interviewed by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences uh, for an article in their journal on the book. Uh, and so, you know, starting to get just a little, little exposure out there. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, you know, that, that was part of the ambition, part of the hope from the start. And uh, you know, baby steps, but we'll we'll hopefully go down that path a little further as well. Awesome. Um, before I turn it over to questions, talk from all of you. Um, I guess I just have one final question, which is, um, what's next? Uh, I know that you said you're traveling a lot to share this book, um, but maybe in your intellectual work, also Sheila in your organizing work, or both of you in your organizing work, um, what do we have to look forward to or look out for for you guys? Well, Ken's national and hopefully international book tour <laughs> is coming soon, summer and fall, and probably fall of 2022, 23, and then perhaps 2024. So <laughs> he's in high demand. So look out for that. Um, we're going to be helping organize his book tour. And then in terms of Pivot to Peace, we're going to continue to engage in this work to engage in the truth telling that needs to happen, that desperately needs to happen. And 
shameless plug, if you guys are not following Pivot to Peace, follow Pivot to Peace at Peace Pivot um, on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, and yeah, we're just going to continue our efforts in just fighting against this propaganda narrative around China and to mobilize ordinary people who are against war, who are for peace, to really understand this issue that's happening between the U.S. and China in this new Cold War. Um, and yeah, you know, promote promote peace rather than war. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, uh, as Sheila says, um, you know, we, <laughs> we have this semi-relentless-looking book tour um, <laughs> project, ambitious. which, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do. My, my wife has some thoughts about this, but, um, but <laughs> no. Uh, uh, but um, other things that are going on, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you get one thing uh, rolled out, and, and then there's something else coming down the pike, which is that uh, we have another book, uh, that is a, it's, it's basically transcripts of a nine-part series that uh, Brian and Becker and I did on the, uh, on the socialist program, which has a tentative working title of China and the World, uh, 1949 to 1920, or wherever we wind up wrapping it up. Uh, but this is, this is essentially uh, a, a long and, and somewhat detailed discussion of um, Chinese foreign policy, the, the principles underlying it, the, 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 the winding road of that, and, and that's an area, again, as, as we explore a little bit in this book, where um, it hasn't all been a, a sort of seamless advance. Uh, you know, China, for, for, uh, in many periods, was a great promoter of revolutionary struggles in other countries. Uh, but as this period of accommodation with global capital came along, that, uh, that, those projects, many of them fell by the, by the wayside. Uh, and that's something of which I think many people are, are advisedly uh, somewhat critical. Um, what is China's relationship with the world like now? How, what are the underlying uh, objectives that they have? We have things like the Belt and Road Initiative. How do we think about that? Uh, there's a lot of ways in which uh, uh, understanding not just what's going on in China, but the, the interrelations between uh, the Chinese Revolution and, and the larger uh, it, it's the country's relations with other other parts of the world and, and sort of the implications of China's experience uh, for other parts of the world, whether it's kind of an inspirational uh, a beacon in some ways for developing people. Uh, and of course, it has been a, a, a challenge to uh, the dominance of the West. Uh, and, and that has led to, you know, China's, or a rather American, the long period of American hostility, and then Nixon's trip, and now uh, a revival of this Cold War mentality. So we try to chart that out. So that's another thing that will be forthcoming. I don't know exactly what the production target for that is, but uh, that will also be uh, coming out with 1804 books. Um, uh, the, the, the book tour, as we said. And then uh, my own, um, um, you know, more academic work, uh, uh, I'm, I'm engaged in a project that I hope to, to bring to fruition within the next year or two um, that looks back uh, earlier in Chinese history um, and, and, uh, and argues that if we, if we look at the long sweep of China's history that, that we can push back almost a thousand years with an understanding that China had its own, its own form, its own very distinctive version of capitalism. Um, and and this, this goes against a lot of the traditional understanding within, within Marxist scholarship, uh, which has been overshadowed by, by various interpretations that look at this sort of lockstep journey from slavery to feudalism to capitalism. And that's not a trajectory that really applies very well in China. So we're, we're trying to formulate new understandings because if we can understand China's history in a more accurate and a more his materialist analysis, um, that gives us insights that may be applicable to the situation today because we can see the relationship between the state and markets with a longer perspective and, and with what the Chinese themselves utilize as a different toolkit of pro, you know, policy, practice, experience uh, that may help us to, to appreciate some of the complexities of navigating the path upon which they are embarked at the present. So 
different projects like that are in the works, and um, that's what's coming down the pike. <laughs> <laughs> that's very exciting. I'm sure we'll all follow at Peace Pivot and also keep an eye out for Ken's travels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, any questions from the audience, we welcome them. Start there, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, I guess there's a couple things. I think the, the anti-Asian violence is very much part, it's linked to the anti-China rhetoric and policies. And uh, I'm gonna make a few points, and you can comment on the points. I think uh, it's clear that the major force that's driving the policies is, is the neoconservatives that are very much embedded in our government right now. People like Victoria Newland, who is married to Robert Cogon, for example. I think I made this point in the past. And it's interesting that even the bourgeoisie in, in many countries are, are not necessarily for confrontation, they're for business. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important point to make that it's who's really driving these policies and why. I think it's very much part of the British model of economic development and colonialism. But I think the critical thing to look at is that as far as China is concerned in its development, it's clear that the incorporation of the market was critical in its success. And I think that Mao had that intention from the very beginning, the fact that the bourgeoisie was very much part of the revolutionary process, but because of the beginning of the Cold War, that process ended. Um, and I think that relationship has made it easier for us as a political movement because clearly it shows that you can have broad sectors of society that could be part of an anti-colonial movement, not just the working class, but all classes, as long as they come along with the, with the proper perspective and platform, basically anti-war, anti-imperialism, which is kind of the contradictions that we deal with in, in typical Marxian analysis. But I think that made the process easier for us on the, on the left to build a broad united front within the imperialist countries, given the fact that we're not subject to invasions and wars. We don't have that luxury. And we have to obviously organize on the basis of that. And like you said, the Belt and Road Initiative makes it easier for us because it's, it incorporates all these other countries. Actually, at the appeal of the Belt and Road Initiative far exceeds what the Soviet model has existed. And that is pulling in Latin America, is pulling in the Middle East. And uh, that appeal is what the neoconservatives and the imperialists are against. So few comments and your thoughts sure sure no I think those that's that's very insightful I think that that on a couple of on a couple of, uh, of, of uh, sort of topics obviously the you know this <laughs> this posture of, of hatred this posture of, of fear-mongering this ramping up the the the, the threat of war um, this has driven the 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 <laughs> in a sense, the, the revitalization or re-energization of racist attitudes that, have, that you know, go back into the 19th century, but that, that you know, for a while seem to have been at least you know, not, not boiling quite so intensely. Uh, and of course, this is, as you say, it's anti-Asian hatred. It's anti-Asian racism because it may be that the political rhetoric is directed against China, but in the minds of many people, uh, you know, there's not a there's not a, a lot of subtlety and distinction drawn. You know, in how people look, and so you know, someone who for you know on whatever subjective basis someone pe perceives as as Asian, they don't know. You know, Asian, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, whatever. Um, these people are now being the focus of, of of you know this this horrible tide of of racist violence that we that we have here. This is one of the things that Pivot to Peace, uh, in particular, has been trying to focus on and trying to talk about. And of course, we get a lot of, of um, lip service and, and, and sympathy talk from uh, from liberal politicians, uh, but uh, you know the the fact is that it's the very policies that they're promoting and 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 projecting uh, that are driving this. You know that that so I, I I completely agree with that. And the I think the other uh, uh, this idea of sort of inclusiveness of of, uh, of different elements in the struggle, that's one of the things that's most important. Well, one of the uh, we, I didn't talk about this tonight at all yet, but uh, uh, you know, one of the things that that I do look at and and that I've been writing about in some other contexts is uh, trying to unpack the phrase with Chinese characteristics. You know, because we hear about 
socialism with Chinese characteristics or uh, you know, uh, Marxism with Chinese characteristics, things like that. And, and I think that's very important um, because uh, it's just a shorthand for the idea uh, which has been elaborated in practice in, in many, many complex ways that the revolution, revolutionary ideology, revolutionary consciousness, it's not, it's not, it's not a cookie cutter. You know, there's not a, it's not a blueprint that you roll out and you go, okay, we do this, this, and this, we need these pieces, and we put it, it's not like that. It's a struggle, it's a dialectical process. Uh, you know, uh, Marx talked about uh, uh, metabolisms and things like that, you know, uh, social metabolism. Um, because it's, it's, it's lived experience, it's not just something that, that we, can, we can follow a, a, a diagram for. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and as, uh, as, as military people talk about, you know, uh, uh, the best operational plans are the first casualty of actual contact with the enemy. You know, that, that we have our ideas and, and we have our, our efforts and, and we try to make our way forward, but we're always encountering uh, the realities that we have to deal with. And so that, that, that ability of, of the Chinese revolutionaries to adapt the, the analytical principles, the methodology, of, of dialectical materialism, historical materialism, and apply that in a, in a flexible, non-rigid, non-dogmatic way to the realities of China and build a revolutionary movement that could fight and could win. Uh, again, as in talking back to our original, uh, one of the early points about, about lessons we can learn, that's one of the most important. Uh, as I said, that, that sort of dialectic between theory and practice, that flexibility and adaptability. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I take your points. <laughs> um, hello, uh, Ken and Sheila, thank you so much for, um, <laughs> okay, do you want to stand a bit? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for writing this book and just shedding some light on China. Now I finally have a book for my English-speaking friends. Um, <laughs> I will give it to them for their birthdays, for <laughs> Christmas, you know, all those things. Uh, thank you so much. And I really appreciate you, Ken, for talking about how China is almost on a different time frame. Because when I try to, as someone who grew up in China, when I try to explain Chinese society, to my friends over here, I often almost lack the language to explain how much culture and values is embedded in tradition, history. When we talk about history in China, it's 5,000 years of history, you know? The last 100 years is nothing. It's just <laughs> a tiny, tiny part of what that looks like. If you go to China, you ask any person, any taxi driver, they can recite a full poem for you from the Tang Dynasty from like, you know, a thousand years ago. So I wonder, in full disclosure, I haven't read the book. In the book, do you go deeper into this sense of history, culture that's embedded in the type of socialism that China is building? Thank you. Yeah, we try to address that. Uh, I think that that's, that's not a major component or a major line of argumentation because what I'm, a lot of what I'm trying to do is just give the narrative from you know, the 19th century to the present. But that all is framed in a way that, that, that has that, I try to incorporate that long-term uh, 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 perspective. You know, there's the, there's the famous uh, uh, anecdote about uh, 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 Premier Zhou Enlai, uh, who uh, back in the 50s at one point found himself in Paris on Bastille Day. And uh, uh, he'd been in Geneva for some negotiations. And, uh, a reporter uh, came up to him and said, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister Zhou, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you think about the, the French Revolution? And he said, well, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> you know, so, so it is a very different, uh, it is a very different perspective. And I, I hope that that, that that feeling comes through. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, hey, I, I'm really excited to read the book. Uh, I was wondering if maybe you could speak a little bit about contemporary working class struggle in China and how that fits into the quest for socialism. Sure, sure. Um, 
talk about that a little bit um, in the book. Uh, you know, this is this is probably one of the key areas that that the contradictions involved in adopting uh, uh, the use of markets to to grow the economy uh, has been has been a challenge, has been a problem uh, because. Uh, part of what goes on, and, and it starts uh, back in the 1980s and, and certainly continues today, is that uh, the application of market mechanisms means that not only in the sector of private capital, but even in the functioning and operations of state-owned enterprises, township and village enterprises, there's a range of variety in which economic productive activity takes place in China, has been subjected to uh, the dynamics of, of markets, which is to say, uh, you know, the, the extraction and accumulation of surplus value uh, from the labor of, of workers, right? And, and we got to acknowledge that that's going on, right? Um, the question is, again, in the long run, how that is integrated into, um, I guess I would say sort of uh, uh, the feedback into society. You know, um, there are there are working class struggles that go on in China. Certainly, there are contradictions within enterprises. There's contradictions on the shop floor um, because there are there are structural tensions within the use of of market mechanisms between the the interests of those who are actually expending their labor power. And those who are who are making decisions about what's going to be done with the value that is produced by that labor power, um, I think that that from my own perspective, the way that that uh, I understand it is that given the parameters, given the oversight of of the Communist Party, given the socialist legal framework, the socialist infrastructure uh, of 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 the economy of, of healthcare provision and things like that, educational opportunity, all this. Not that there aren't contradictions there, but you know the, the basic core um, is that you know, the objective is to enhance people's livelihoods, to raise the overall level of material development in a way which is not, we do not have socialist distribution in China. We need to be very clear about that, you know. The question is whether we are advancing, I should say, whether they are advancing along the path that will allow, as increasing levels of prosperity are reached, for the implementation of socialist distribution. And again, not overnight, in an incremental kind of way. But I think we can see a number of ways in which the value that has been accumulated has in fact been deployed in forms of social distribution. For example, I talk in the book about the experience of workers in 2008. Right? 2008, we have the global financial crisis, we have the meltdown of uh, Western economies. China is impacted by that because consumer demand in the West, poof, evaporates, right? And so, 20 million, maybe a little more than 20 million workers in factories in China lose their jobs. They're laid off, right? They're not cast out on the streets. They're not abandoned to the vicissitudes of the market. But instead, because part of the socialist infrastructure is the household registration system, what's called the hukou system, right? Which means that everybody has a household registration. Now, in the reform era, in, the, in this era of rapid growth and construction, rules and regulations have been adapted that have allowed people to be mobile, to leave their villages where their household registration might be, go to the cities, find employment, be part of that productive economy. But when these 20 plus million people were laid off, they could go back to their villages and they were entitled to Housing, healthcare, educational opportunities for their children. Now, we're not talking, they're not living in the lap of luxury. You know, we don't want to have any illusions about that, but they're getting basic services. They have some place to live. They have food to eat. They've got 
Their kids can go to school. They're not just, you know, they're not losing their homes. We're not facing, China doesn't face the kind of homeless crisis, unhoused crisis that we do here. Well, I saw something, what, Elena has like 76,000 people living on the street. This just does not go on, right? Because there is a socialist infrastructure. And of course, one of the great demonstrations of this was, was coping with COVID, right? Where the priority was on saving people's lives. And that cost the economy. They absorb those costs. They're still working that out. You know, the Chinese economy is, is struggling with, with problems that are still stemming from the response to COVID. But they made that decision. And that's a decision based on the prioritization of human life, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's very different. A capitalist economy, obviously, you know, we sacrificed a million people on the altar of corporate profits here, you know? So that's a very different, that's a very different sensibility. That's not socialist distribution. That's not the direct, uh, you know, from each according to their work, according to, you know, their, their according to their work. Um, but it is, it's not the, the expropriation of surplus value for the consumption and, and you know, self-fulfillment of a tiny elite. It's, it's the deployment of those accumulated values uh, uh, at least to some extent, in meeting social needs. This is part of what underpinned raising 850 million people above absolute poverty. So, again, that's why we talk about it as a work in progress. We're not there. We can't say we're there. We can't wave the flag and say, Ray, for us, we won. But we're sure, they're sure a hell of a lot better off than all those people who lost their homes lost their jobs, lost their savings, wound up living in tents uh, at best. Uh, you know, here in America, mm -hmm. always so proud to be the wealthiest country in the world, uh, but one where, you know, the fruits of labor are, are radically maldistributed. So I, I guess that would be my, my thinking on that. Mm -hmm. Not so many <laughs> Um, hi, um, my name is Erica. I had a lot of like internal questions about kind of like China's relationship to other countries in the global south. Um, I'm a graduate student at the new school studying environmental policy and even for like a supposedly like leftist progressive school, there's still a lot of like xenophobic rhetoric, um, especially <laughs> coming from those like the ultra left who kind of lack a dialectical understanding. Um, so I guess my question is like, a lot of people would describe China as like a sub-imperialist, new colonial um, country um, in their relationship to the global south. I kind of wanted to see like your take on that in terms of like how China's relationship and outreach to these countries has differed significantly from that, you know, practiced by U.S. imperialism, by the IMF, um, the World Bank and other imperialist institutions. Sure. Um let me respond to that in, 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 in two ways. One, uh, just the, sort of to the first part, um, there are uh, you know, significant elements on the left um, who take a very critical view of China, who uh, sort of equate American imperialism and Chinese neo-imperialism, they say, who believe uh, that China has simply, you know, sold out to capitalism and, and become a, a essentially a capitalist uh, uh, society. Obviously, I disagree with that. Um, but I also, whoops, knocking my, my mic off here. I also have a, a kind of understanding of it in the sense that uh, certainly for, for people of, of my generation, you know, I mean, <laughs> Coming into the movement back in the 60s and everything, uh, you know, we were we were pretty fired up. I had my red book, you know, and I remember reading about the Cultural Revolution, and then, you know, this was this was this was rocking it. Um, and we need to remember that that in that context, there was a lot of a lot of rhetoric about capitalist rotors and things like that. You know, had its particular function in that in that context. Um, and after after the chairman, uh, you know, went off to meet Marx. Uh, Things changed, 
and uh, uh, you know. No, I, I, I mean, I mean, when when Mao left the planet. <laughs> Yeah. No, I know he meant Nixon. <laughs> Hopefully the encounter with Marx was more productive. But, um, but uh, yeah, where was I? Um, things changed, right, right, right. Where, where was I? Yeah, well, that's certainly true. Um, I kind of lost track on that. Take me back to your question. Oh, uh, people's attitudes. Right, right, right. So uh, that was it. Sorry. Um, a lot, lot going on. Um, and, and I think that, that many people became very disillusioned. Many people were like, dang, the bad guys won, you know? And, and, they, and, you know, and the embrace of markets uh, opening up to the West. Nixon, who the hell thought Richard Nixon would be in, in Beijing? I mean, this was a shocking moment. You know, even before the ascent of, of Deng Xiaoping. Um, and so it became very easy for a while to, to be very critical and, and, and to condemn China and say, yeah, you know, they really did go down the capitalist road. And it has taken a while uh, to, to be able to see things a little more clearly, to be able to have, again, that kind of longer historical perspective and a more dialectical understanding. Um, but I think a lot of people never got past that. And, and that has become a mindset, um, which right now is, <laughs> in some ways, it's very convenient for people, especially like people in academic circles. I face a lot of this in academic circles, you know, especially the, the, the modernists, the people that work on, on contemporary China. They are, many of them are, are, you know, they're certainly not, they don't think of themselves as being in lockstep with American imperialism, but they do reproduce these attitudes of hostility towards China, uh, to actually existing China, in the name of some idealized, uh, you know, uh, fantasy uh, that, that never did exist, doesn't exist now, and, and probably never would. But, you know, again, it's that, it's that sort of purity fetish, you know, that, that Ch if China's not the, the perfect socialism as I envision it, then, then you know, we have to write them off. So you get that sort of a, you know, a pox on both their houses kind of thing. And, and as I say, I, I think that's a fundamental uh, error. Um, as far as, as China's relation, you know, things like the BRI, we hear a lot, of course, about, uh, about China in Africa and the whole debt, trapped, uh, debt trap rhetoric and everything. Um, uh, there's a there's a substantial body of of scholarship, and not only on the left. I, I recommend for people who are interested in this question the work of a, a scholar named Deborah Brautigam, uh, who's written extensively several books and a number of uh, articles about uh, 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 China in Africa, the nature of the assistance that China provides, uh, the nature of those investments. Uh, of course, China has been uh, uh, making statements about this itself recently. They've been forgiving a lot of debt, rescheduling a, a lot of debt. You know, we don't want to see things like the BRI, as I said a little bit earlier. We don't want to see these. It's not a charity operation. It's not a giveaway. You know, they're not philanthropists. But they are seeking, as, as Xi Jinping says, you know, shared, a shared future for humanity common prosperity, things that will benefit other countries, help them to grow, will also be beneficial for China because they'll have dynamic interactions, they'll have trade, they'll have cultural relations, you know. A lot of the investment that goes into these countries goes into things like infrastructure, but it also goes into things like hospitals and schools, sports stadiums, stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you just have to get down in the weeds with it and, and, and see that they're not impoverishing other countries. Even today, countries, a lot of the African countries, yeah, they have some, they have some debt to China. But if you look at the structure of their foreign debt, well over 80% of it is still owed to the West. And not just to things like the IMF and the World Bank, but to a lot of private equity funds, other kinds of government operations, the big banks, uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, you know, is a huge, huge carrier. Of of, uh, of obligations from from the and they're not you know they're not interested in 
uh, in long-term development. They're interested in, in their, their profits and their quarterly statements and things like that. So it's just a different, it's a different ball game. Um, uh, but there, but there's, there's, there's a wealth of data out that you just have to, again, get, get past the headlines and, and, and the fear mongering. And I would just like to add too, yeah. also um, about resources on China's relationship with the Global South. I highly recommend, someone actually mentioned it to me earlier, is following Dongsheng News. They really report a lot of the news headlines that go on. Yes, round of applause for Dongsheng News. Um, and also, if you're not following Dongsheng News, News's podcast, The Crane, where they specifically talk about the relationship between China and Africa. I'm not going to embarrass the host, but she's in the room. Um, <laughs> so go talk to her. Follow it as a valuable resource um, so that you can, you can arm yourself with knowledge to talk to people who have these uh, thoughts about China. Um, hello. <laughs> Hi, um, Ken and Sheila. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I finished this book last night, and it's awesome. <laughs> and um, this is more, um, I guess, directed. This is a question for both of you, but mostly directed at Sheila. Um, I think that um, something that I've had to grow sympathy towards is this is sort of what Ken was describing was um, speaking to people who are older than me, who have gone through, who have witnessed and felt the sort of like, like you were speaking about the emotional reaction to the, the shifts, historical shifts that China has gone through um, and being more sympathetic to um, also being patient on the side of, of people who consider themselves in the Imperial Corps and on the side of China um, and being patient for that, you know, patient that, patience that was created. Um, and so as somebody who was born sort of post the previous Cold War, supposedly previous Cold War, um, I'm wondering if you could talk about like the work that you've done and wh how this sort of new Cold War looks in comparison to the, the, the previous era, what we should expect as young people organizing to defend China within the United States. Um, yeah, that's yeah. it. Please. Yeah, I mean, well, I was also born after the Cold War, so I can't, I can't tell you too much about <laughs> <laughs> the attitudes during the Cold War, but I guess in my time of organizing around, you know, just social justice and anti-war efforts for almost a decade now, is that is, is truly having faith in the people. I think that that is the number one thing that keeps a lot of us who have been in the movement going. I think that it's very easy to be in these academic circles, to be in these ultra left spaces and write off the masses as not being capable of being won over to these ideas and to the truth. I think that that's false. I think that we can. And I think that even when you meet someone and talk to someone that will casually you know, say some um, lie that the media has fed them about China, when you ask questions, it's like the first time that anyone's ever questioned that fact. So I think, again, like I said earlier, um, telling the truth is an act of courage and telling the truth and just engaging in p very patient conversations with people is well worth it. Um, and yeah, talking to people about their experiences and relating it back to China. I think that COVID, you know, I know it's been quite a few years now. Um, it's still fresh in our minds, but just talking about the experience of how China dealt with COVID and how the United States has dealt with COVID, that's a, that's a point of like connection that we can make with people. So I think engaging in those conversations is very important. Having patience, having faith in the people, but also again, being humble um, ourselves of not coming at people like we know better, right? Um, because we have to honor people's experiences as well. Um, and yeah, I've learned a lot just from this book, from finding the language to talk to my parents about their experiences of being in China and how much they actually appreciate it. Um, and so, yeah, just, I, I think that also growing as an organizer is very important too, reflecting on what we've learned um, and bringing that to the people as well. Go with Joyce, too. Um, OK, we'll do one more question, and then Joyce. 
don't have to bend down. <laughs> um, I, I'm a contemporary of Ken's. I remember the Ken State Massacre very well, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. And China was such a huge influence on the movement here at the time. And I think it's important to talk about, well, what does China have to do with us? And what do we have to do with China? You know, uh, uh, one of my priorities was the, the, uh, the women's movement. Uh, I was in Red Stockings. That was the, the group that uh, had the first uh, uh, demonstration about abortion. And we, were the, we did consciousness raising. Uh, we had came up with the slogan, the personal is political. That all came from the Chinese Revolution. It came from a chapter of Jack Belden's book, China Shakes the World, called Goldflower Story. And it's about when the Chinese uh, military was, the, the revolutionary military was advancing. It would often go to the women first and hear their stories because they were the most oppressed in the peasant villages. And Goldflower told her story about how she was beaten by her husband and all the women gathered around and spoke bitterness. And everyone spoke bitterness about, about the landlords. Uh, and so we took that up in Red Stockings and we sat around the room and talked about our experience. And it was so revolutionary for us. And that was just one thing that the Chinese Revolution gave to us at the time of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, you know, like people were walking around with their red books and their Mao jackets. And <laughs> it was a big emotional thing that, that helped thrust our movements forward. Yes. It was a gift to us. Yes. You know, so what, what, what is, a lot has happened since then. There's no Soviet Union. We have seen that China can make big economic reforms and, 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 and uh, help develop capitalism, but at the same time, keep a socialist framework. We didn't know that at the time, that that could happen because the Soviet Union collapsed doing that. So we learned that. We learned how voracious capitalism can be here. I mean, we were the first people who really rose above our parents, our generation. You know, where there was a myth that you could keep on advancing. We were the ones who advanced the most, the first to go to college as a working class. You, you have so much debt, you can't even go into the areas that, that you studied. You know, now look at this ruling about debt. Look, look what's happened to the youth of this country. What can we learn from China? We didn't think about socialism that much. We just pushed the struggle forward here. We didn't think that we had to really build socialism here. But it's so apparent now that you have to do it. And there are so many lessons from China on how to do it piece by piece under the most difficult circumstances. And I think this book provides the most clarity, looking back in retrospect, on how that was done in, in different times. And it's a thing for us to study, to move our own struggle forward. Okay. All right, I mean, what an awesome way to end. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in that vein, I guess I just want to again plug this book. It's a really excellent book. As Joseph was saying, it's, it provides so much clarity. As other people were saying, it gives us so much language. Um, you know, it, t it teaches us about the differences between the cultures between the U.S. and our own, or our own perspectives and how p Chinese people are experiencing their revolution. Um, and it also shows us that there is a, a real danger in not knowing history and not understanding history so that we can understand our current context. What does it look like when we don't know history? We see it every day in the conversations we have with people in the media when they don't interrogate their own history. Um, even in Sheila's introduction, looking back at, at news articles, if we don't know that, we don't see a, a constant thread of attacking communism, attacking people's movements all around the world. And this book is just one intervention into to stopping that and to informing ourselves so that we can engage our communities and we can get involved in the struggle and defend socialist projects around the world. Um, so in that vein, you can watch 36 episodes of Ken's <laughs> YouTube video, or you can read this book. <laughs> or you can do both. You can do both. Um, so in the me and that vein, don't forget to get the book from 1804 Books over there or 1804books.com. Um, thank you very much to Ken and Sheila for your time, and thank you all for your time as well. Um, thank you so much.